Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I think we will have a few minutes at the end of the session. So um, if you guys want to stick around, we'll do another round of questions at the very end. Um, back to Florida. Um, cattle dipping vets, apparently there were 3,400 of them built back in the day. Um, I'm sure they were very useful, practical, environmentally innocent looking at the time. Yet here we are, 100 years later or so, and we are still dealing with them and identifying them. So our last presentation of the day is Dr. Leslie Smith and Karin Brown from SCS Engineers, and they will educate us about the subject. for myself. Hello, my name is Leslie. This is my colleague, Corinne. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming this afternoon. Um, we'll make sure to make this quick enough. That way <laughs> you guys can get to the welcome banquet and use your drink tickets accordingly. Um, today we're going to talk about the mitigation efforts um, of a case study for cattle dip bat assessment. So I'm going to let Corinne take it away from here. I'm going to start off with a brief history. So um, cattle ranching came to Florida about 500 years ago. Um, and because of the topography and how flat Florida is, it really lends itself to cattle ranching. So it quickly became an integral part of the Florida economy. In fact, I'll start out with a fun fact. Um, the first cowboys, so the first ever cowboys came out of Florida, not Texas. Um, so, in the early 1900s, um, the cattle ranchers be began to modernize and all of that um, travel and bringing in new things also brought in the um, Texas fever tick, um, also known as the cattle fever tick, um, which is host to um, pathogens that cause cattle tick fever. And cattle tick fever causes death in about 90% of cattle that get the disease. So it was very um, dire. Um, by 1915, legislation had passed requiring um, the construction and use of cattle dip vats to kill any ticks present um, and constructions of the cattle dip vats um, continued until about 1960. Um, any livestock, um, not just cattle, so horses, goats, things like that, any livestock were required to be dipped every two weeks during this time. Um, programs like this were carried out all throughout the Southeast, and the last reported case of uh, cattle tick fever was in Palm Beach County in 1960. So the program closed out in 1961 after the successful eradication of the cattle fever tick. Uh, there's over 3,281 registered cattle dip bats in Florida, though registration is not required, so there's probably many, many more. Um, as stated previously, the cattle dip program began in 1915 and came to the conclusion in 1961 where the cattle uh, fever tick was officially considered eradicated. Common COCs at cattle dip sites are arsenic and OCPs. Um, arsenic was the most common pesticide used in the solution but OCPs were also used in some places, primarily DDT and toxaphene. Um, other ones that were also used are on the screen, but we just test for the whole array of OCPs to make sure that it's all covered. Florida State Legislature held that private property owners could not be held liable for discharges caused by cattle dip vats, though they could um, choose to clean it up if they um, 
wanted to. Also, any waste from and around a cattle dip vat in Florida required to be characterized before being sent to a landfill to make sure it's not hazardous. So when we're doing phase ones and site visits, these are some important things to look for um, with the cattle dip vat. So when you're reviewing historical records and aerials, if there were livestock pens in your aerials or there's historical pasture land where your site is or around where your site is, it's important to look for cattle dip vats. Um, and when you do your site in, um, inspection, it's important to um, thoroughly inspect the site, especially uh, easy pathways, because they're going to choose, the farmers would have chosen the path of least resistance. Um, areas with remnants of gates and livestock pens and overgrown areas. Um, overgrown areas are important because the cattle dip vats were not required to be cleaned up after the program um, ceased. So a lot of them were just left as is and the area just overgrew. Some of them were also filled in and the area overgrew, but um, they were not, most of them were not cleaned up. So Leslie is now gonna talk to us a little bit about our site and provide an example of the assessment we did around cattle dip fat. Thank you, Corinne. Um, so a little more information. Now that we know how to actually see and find these cattle dip vats on our property, um, knowing those red flags and how to look for them, we really want to, um, for our site property specifically, we had over 4,300 acres um, in land, all shown in red. So our cattle dip vat, you can see is circled in yellow. Hopefully you can <laughs> see it pretty easily. So it's a very minuscule area um, in the grand scheme of things, but knowing that this was located within um, uh, cattle ranching and pasture lands that takes up approximately half of the whole property. Um, so everything outlined in red, where um, our client's goal is really to, um, for the restoration uh, for natural water storage um, and treatment area, including potential recreational use. Um, this cattle dip bat, um, we do know through historical records that it was taken out of service in 1940. Um, so we don't know when it was put into place, but there is a chance knowing when the program started in Florida in 1915 that there might be approximately 25 years of use um, of this cattle dip bat here um, at this site. So there's also associated livestock pens that do remain intact and are still used limited today. During our first initial um, site visit, we did see and notice that there were still cattle, um, a few cattle compared to using the pens. So once we know um, kind of what a little bit more of the background and site information, we really want to talk with our client and understand their goals and needs for this project. Um, so this project is part of the land stewardship program, which means they have three main goals. They want to conserve and protect water resources. They want to construct and restore um, lands back to their natural state and condition. Um, and they also want to provide an appropriate public use. Um, so that's the overall goal, um, but at the same time, we really want to look more at the site-specific goals for the cattle dip vat assessment in general. So ideally, we want, no, um, we want to reach no further action closure pathway, um, so no ground water or soil restrictions. I think for remediation, that's most of what we aim for, um, but that's not always the case. So with that, doing a, we were doing a limited site assessment, um, and that's really based on the FDEP's cattle dip bat a cleanup guidance um, and the cattle dip bat amended um, MOU. So overall, again, our client really wants to manage these natural communities um, and modify habitats to protect um, and enhance our, the water, floral fauna, uh, resources, as well as provide resource-based public use opportunities. So based on our client goals, we can really focus in on what our data quality objectives are for this site and this project. Um, and 
knowing that this site they want to use for water storage and treatment area, um, we know that they want to ultimately this land will be inundated. So we really want to treat these soils more as sediments, um, not just the soils. And we don't want to really look at them for like this residential or commercial industrial standards like we typically do um, for a lot of our assessment sites, um, with the exception of arsenic. So for arsenic, we're really looking to use the FDEP recre recreation criteria of the 5.5 milligrams per kilogram. And that's because there is that potential use that our client's looking towards to try to use um, for horseback riding, fishing, um, hiking and biking trails. Um, so we really want to keep that in mind um, as we're going through and um, looking at our data. So the remaining uh, metals and OCPs, we're really using and looking at the sediment quality assessment guidelines as applicable, or the SQUAGs, as some of you might know them. Um, so there's two different levels to the SQUAGs. We have the threshold effect concentrations, which is a more conservative value, and it's really utilized more as a scre screening tool in evaluating um, the sediments. So any concentrations that are below those SQUAG TECs, um, and they generally don't warrant um, any further evaluation or investigation. Um, the other tier for the SQUAGs that we use are the SQUAG PECs or probable effect concentrations. Um, it's a less conservative value, so a little higher concentration that's allowed. Um, and that really represents uh, the level above which adverse effects are likely to occur. How likely? Kind of unsure, so we don't want to go above that level. Um, also, during our own internal QAQC, we will use um, or use the guidance for selection of analytical methods and for the valuation of practical quantitation li limits, so PQLs for us. So now that we know and have a better understanding of the data quality objectives, our client goals, you can really go in and create a sampling plan based on those efforts. Um, again, as I stated earlier, we are using more of the FDP kettle dip fat guidance for the sampling plan. So um, you can see outlined in black, there's the cattle vat as kind of the longer rectangle with the associated drip pad that's still there at the site. Um, so we wanted to focus our area around that because during um, the treatment process for the ticks on the cattle, they'd go through the vat and then they'd sit on the drip pad and really just um, be there in that area until they, their coach dried off and were moved on. So we focused around the boundary of the cattle dip vat and drip, pit, uh, drip pad and then um, did 10 foot step outs in each direction. So we did approximately 34 or 35 um, soil samples conducting hand augering. Um, we did notice that the groundwater elevation was about a foot below the land surface. Um, and most of, the, uh, most of the borings, there were a few locations where there was, um, the groundwater was seen at about a foot. So based on our client's needs and goals, we really just wanted to look at the VEDO zone. Um, so soil samples were only collected accordingly in those. Um, we're also doing groundwater assessment, um, one in each of the north, south, east, west directions. Um, and again, like Karen mentioned before, arsenic and OCPs are the main COCs. So that's all we're assessing here um, today for these. So our sampling results for arsenic, we did see one location in the top six inches um, that was above the FDEP recreational criteria. It's just to the east of the drip pad, um, the red little dot there, SB30, with the remaining arsenic concentrations were all below um, that 5.5 that we're aiming for. Um, the remaining metals and OCPs, uh, we're all below the SQUAG PECs. So after discussing and having conversations with our client, um, we really determined that we just needed to compare to the SQUAG PECs, so that's probable, probable effect concentration, um, rather than the TECs. Um, and so those were all found below. Um, and based on, on our soil assessment, we were able to delineate and find um, an area for source removal. We will do sidewall confirmation as needed if the client um, requests that. But at this time, there's approximately 300 cubic yards of soil that will be removed. Um, like Corinne said, for removal, we will have to characterize that soil. So that's something that will also have to be done. Um, at this point. So we'll be aiming for a no further action uh, closure pathway with the soil. As far as groundwater goes, we're still pending the source removal. Um, 
as you know, some projects don't go on the timelines that you uh, plan for, so we're still pending the source removal. Um, and once that is completed, we will do um, the well installations and the groundwater assessment. Um, and ideally, we'll be monitoring for two quarters, and hopefully after that, be able to um, uh, request NFA closure for groundwater. Um, overall, the project benefits um, for you know, not only this location, but other projects uh, like this is really to conserve and protect Florida so water resources, um, restore the land back to its natural state and condition, um, and provide an area for recreational use of the property. Um, so if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them for you. I'm just curious, yeah. what was the bottom of a vat? Was it open dirt or was it? it? I mean, it was open, but because of the water table so high, there was some sludge in it and stuff. So it will be assessed before removal. But when the farmer made it, he just dug a hole? And yeah, it, it, yeah, with the cinder blocks and created it. And most of the stuff was actually constructed and funded from the government entities. It was required by the government. Um, yeah. And it had a solution of either concentrated arsenic, mm -hmm. uh, pesticides, or concentrated OCPs that would go up to the cattle's neck. Yeah. So they would then About be three to four to go feet through it, get it all over them, and then they'd hang out on the drip pad. Below the water. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah. But it's like con it's concrete under. It's hard to tell because obviously there's standing water in that photo um, <laughs> from rains. So. Uh, yes. Quick question. How were you able to simulate sediment conditions to compare to those sediment quality assessment guidelines? We did not um, actually, com we compared them to the sediment quality uh, guidance, the SQUAGs, but we did not do any type of you know, assessment based on that soil specifically, any type of testing. That's just based on what our client wanted and what um, they've done in the past and what they preferred. So you didn't collect any actual samples and send them to the lab? N not to assess how it react as a sediment, no. Thank you. Hi. I, I just have a quick question. Given what you just said about the base of the cattle dip in VAT, mm -hmm. I'm just intrigued as to where you put your groundwater monitoring was or where you proposed them because they seem to be outside of where would be the source area. Yeah, so the idea behind, um, originally at one point our client wanted us to do the soil assessment and then do the groundwater before source removal, but they decided to move forward to let's do source removal. So if that's the source creating the groundwater plume, then it's removed and then we can go in and do the assessment there. <laughs> but your source removal is to one foot. Well, well ex with the exception, sorry, I should have said, with the exception of the actual vat and drip pad, the, all the construction will be removed. Um, for that as well. Yep. <laughs> All the pieces to it. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned some guidance earlier about allowing the contamination to stay on site. Is that only for the registered cattle vats or if you can prove that it was a cattle vat? Um, the, oh, so they're, they don't, they aren't required to remove them or assess them, but obviously if you're a landowner and that's on your property and you're trying to sell the land, it's either going to devalue your property and that's going to be part of the deal, or you'd have to kind of take some remediation um, efforts to it. So. so the state does fund this or they, yes. don't, they do fund this? Okay. Yes. Any more questions? Dr. Smith, Mrs. Brown, thank you very much.